Hi, everybody, and thanks for joining us this morning, this morning on the East Coast. Uh, today, we have EverStream Intelligence Solutions Analyst Anthony Yanchuk to share insights into the U.S. US West Dock worker disruptions. That is a bit of a tongue twister. Tony will brief us on the latest developments in Outlook, and then we'll take your questions. Go ahead and submit your questions at any time using the GoToWebinar question widget. So now I'm going to hand it over to Tony, and I will be back for the Q&A. Thanks, Pedro. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for the EverStream Analytics ILW PMA Port Situation Briefing Call. My name is Anthony Yanchuk, and I'm an analyst with EverStream's Intelligence Solutions team, where we've been closely tracking the negotiations with the goal of analyzing those latest developments from the talks, as well as keeping potential disruptions in focus as the negotiations continue. Now, at the current moment, the talks have not reached any significant breaking point on those key issues, right? namely port automation and employee benefits wages. Despite starting at the beginning of May, the talks were already suspended from May 20th to June 1st, setting the stage for likely a drawn out negotiation period that under most accounts will last past the contract expiration on July 1st. This means that up to 40% of containerized traffic could be under threat if labor actions occur at IOW operated ports, really depending on the scope, severity, length, and then also the plan that uh, labor leaders will use um, moving past the contract expiration. Now, we have seen labor move first in the negotiations when the IOW suspended the, uh, the talks um, and did not specify a reason for the stoppage, right? That was the May 20th to June 1st period where no talks were taking place. Um, it's highly likely that the ILW's motion delay uh, to delay is part of that posturing that we're seeing given the deadlock over these breaking point issues. Now, the ILWU this year is really looking to strike a strong line against automation as technology has improved significantly over the past couple of years in terms of container automation. Um, and the group is really looking forward to clawing back some of those concessions they've made in previous negotiations, specifically in regards to automation. Now, one thing we have seen uh, come up out of the talks over the last weeks uh, is uh, the point over, over facility, or earlier facility opening times from 6 a.m., which has the support of trucking groups that say that the measures will improve efficiency, um, but this is probably more of part of the typical negotiation cycle we see um, in these talks, right? Starting with those less contentious issues uh, where some common ground can potentially be found and then moving towards automation and wages as the contract expiration nears. Um, there's a lot of factors also outside the negotiations themselves that are likely being uh, considered uh, and will impact what labor actions take place, namely that expected import surge from China, uh, global freight prices and movements were still at record highs uh, year on year, although there are some trends that we'll talk about later that are quite interesting. Uh, and also public opinion on the negotiations during this midterm election year uh, that may or may not determine what the potential intervention from the Biden administration may look like. There's also other operational and tactical level considerations such as staffing, budgeting, et cetera, that are also likely in play. But then again, they always come back to those two main key issues of automation and then wages. Back and forth rhetoric is likely to continue uh, over the next couple of weeks as uh, both the ILWU and PMA makes their case for you know, why automation is good or bad or you know, why wages should be increased or decreased. You'll probably see a lot of talks about inflation on that latter point. So in EverStream's previous port calls with customers, our team outlined scenarios of a you know, work slowdown, partial work stop, uh, work to rule, or that complete strike scenario at uh, West Coast ports. Um, port of Oakland's LWU chapter over this past weekend has already called for a daytime strike on June 20th, right? officially in observance of the Juneteenth holiday, but practically given the proximity to the expiration on July 1st, the strike could provide a lot of good insights into how labor actions at a West Coast port could cause some kind of disruptions, right? Really essential to watch where those delays are felt, uh, seeing cargo delivery delays, things of that nature um, within this one event, right? So the immediate impact of striking actions at West Coast ports would clearly paralyze those facilities, uh, but those hidden risks lie in the bottlenecks uh, that would occur if an import surge from East China causes a cascading effect of disruption. 
uh, not only at those facilities of labor actions, but also the seemingly well-planned alternatives that can become quickly overwhelmed. So our intelligence solutions team has already seen some micro trends uh, as part of our port tracking in the past few weeks that show what this volatile impact of uh, you know, redirects to alternative facilities on the US Gulf and the East Coast mainly uh, can look like. Remember, this is under the backdrop of falling congestion from the West Coast ports and redirects to East Coast. In the Gulf, we're seeing the port of Houston recently restart work on Saturdays as uh, average waiting time stay elevated at over two days and uh, constant 22 vessels are at anchor from May 15th to June 6th. Now we've actually seen that number increase to 28 vessels as of the newest data from the last week. Port of Mobile is reporting a similar situation with waits around 1.5 days and vessel queues starting to grow currently at eight vessels. Again, this comes as Asia West Coast freight rates have fallen. I mean, another you know, 11% from the last week of May to the start of June, according to Freitos. Uh, and the figures from Port of Long Beach show congestion figures you know, really waning, waits at less than one day, uh, something that you know a couple months ago uh, would really be unheard of. Meanwhile, coming back to the East Coast, we're seeing uh, wait times balloon at the Port of Norfolk, up to four and a half days, up 160% from last week. While Port of Savannah also passed that four-day mark up 33% from the previous week, continue its upward trend. Again, hard to imagine that Port of Savannah stood at just under four hour waits at the start of May, right? And now they're pushing up uh, past four days. Finally, as another indicator, we see Port of New York parallel this upward trend, uh, sitting at almost two day waits, up 56% from the last week and up 447% on the quarter itself. Um, unlike the West Coast, which has worked through a lot of anchored vessels, given this falling congestion and uh, increased capacity, we're seeing anchorages stay steady or increase at those West, uh, primary East Coast facilities, right? A trend of increasing anchorages in the East Coast and also the Gulf. So let's hone back in on Port of LA Long Beach. There are indicators that the facility itself is in poor shape to handle an import surge, and especially if uh, labor productivity is at all diminished. Uh, rail chassis shortages, as well as truck order lead times of up to one week uh, for all cargo types indicate that tight capacity uh, at the facility. There are also signals that the Port of LA Long Beach could put into effect that container dwell fee if we see those massive volumes come over from East China. Uh, despite setting up the effective queue system at LA LGB, um, analysts expect congestion to increase in that robust China surge and potentially create severe bottlenecks. We're also seeing for the first time in a long time, uh, carriers start to make weekly rate adjustments, which is a fundamental, indica fundamental indicator of oversupply in certain spot markets. Uh, and you know, we saw shippers build up a lot of capacity to deal with that congestion that was happening at Long Beach and other West Coast ports moving in the earlier part of this year, but now we're seeing a lot of oversupply from that side uh, and blank sailings have fallen uh, or pardon me, increased as a result. Uh, additionally, there's new routes to um, Mexico from Asia, providing alternatives. Uh, we've seen the shippers kind of adapt and create new routes uh, to get around congestion and react to market trends, right? There's a lot of demand now for alternatives um, and new routes that uh, may potentially go around the, the, the you know, labor actions that may occur at ILW ports. And the big one that a lot of folks are talking about now is the China surge, right? The timing of a potential China surge in U.S. bound exports is a major factor underlying the impact of these uh, you know, potential labor actions at U.S. ports. There is around 260,000 undelivered TEU in China from April 2022 alone. Um, analysts are saying that the recovery of Chinese trucking, namely the ability of trucks to uh, to cross provinces and enter cargo facilities is a primary factor here, which per official figures is currently at 80%. Uh, we're seeing still some movement restrictions happening on the local level in terms of like COVID testing, restrictions, quarantine periods uh, that are still you know, impacting that number. Additionally, we see a lot of foreign shippers resume uh, activities within Shanghai warehouses. I know Maersk recently reopened its facilities at the port of Shanghai to normal operating levels. So there are signs of an ongoing recovery within the industrial sphere in East China. Um, and that capability of moving the goods uh, via road to ocean and rail hubs on the mainland is likely that key indicator 
uh, of when an import surge may come. Now, I think it's important to temper this resumption kind of storyline with uh, the newest lockdowns that we're seeing in Shanghai, uh, targeted district level lockdowns, um, as well as the decreased business sentiment that we're seeing amongst a lot of uh, foreign companies within China more broadly, um, that is gonna be really impacting the resumption. And finally, on the resumptions themselves, official figures are placing that um, you know, industrial production resumption around 80% of capacity, but we've seen industry analysts kind of temper that figure and say that's probably closer to 40 to 50% recovered, uh, with a strong peak expected in US bound exports when the full recovery is felt. Um, so monitoring the reported COVID situation is therefore a key ask, uh, aspect of what our China task force does day to day at Intelligence Solutions. And that involves, you know, looking at not only the COVID case numbers, but also these targeted lockdowns and these movement restrictions that we're seeing uh, being applied fairly asymmetrically. So it could take a couple of months to see that physical congestion pile up at the facilities. And given that the current reopening timeline for China um, is set to kind of pull out a surge at the sensitive time right after the contract expires on July 1st, uh, and the ramp up to back to school season between August, and September. Uh, this is something definitely to watch. This presents an opportunity for the ILWU to work out these staged uh, work disruptions in a matter that spurs concessions from the PMA and shippers as the industry feels the bite of uh, increased congestion at those critical facilities on the West Coast. Um, but the exact plan of action remains within the closely uh, you know, guarded walls of the negotiation room as both parties have implemented a media blackout. Um, so we will not find out uh, likely what those actions will be until the contract itself expires. Um, again, some big things to watch out for, recovery of uh, trucking in China, but then also in the US, we've kind of been dealing with an ongoing trucker shortage uh, and it's been a fairly slow recovery in that arena, as well as watching those rail chassis supply issues and also rail metering that we're seeing, um, particularly uh, between the East Coast facilities into you know, inland hubs, but then also uh, potentially from the West Coast as well. Uh, and we're also looking at, um, you know, the worst risk scenario being the confluence of, of uh, port disruptions from strikes, coupling with the import surge from China, um, the existing rail and intermodal issues combining to make it difficult to move goods out when they do make it to uh, West Coast ports, um, those road trucking shortages that I just mentioned, and then also maritime weather events being a wild card um, amongst all of these, right? When alternatives are placed within the Gulf and the East Coast, we're passing through areas that are at high risk uh, during hurricane season for disruptions. And we could see bottlenecks uh, happen uh, in certain places like the Panama Canal as vessels you know, slow down uh, to avoid that. Um, but certainly something that our applied meteorology team at Everstream looks at very closely uh, and you know, updates our customers on. So that's a general overview of the current situation with the ILWU PMA uh, negotiations. Um, and with that, I'll pass it back to Phaedra for Q&A. Thanks, Phaedra. Great, thank you so much. I'm gonna jump right into the questions that we have here and please do keep submitting your questions as we go along. Uh, first question, do you have any insight into how the Ocean Shipping Reform Act may tie in to the contract negotiations and how alliance carriers may respond to the bill being passed as U.S. law. Sure. Yeah, so we see uh, the Biden administration fairly adamantly supporting the uh, Ocean Shipping Reform Act. Uh, and we're kind of seeing that the OSRA would shift that onus of proving, you know, things like container storage fees and a bunch of other lo uh, legal liabilities uh, when it comes to pricing. Um, onto themselves, right? So they'll be responsible for making sure that, you know, their detention and demurrage fees comply with the U.S. shipping law. Um, Legislation is also calling for the maritime, uh, for the maritime, uh, Federal Maritime Commission, pardon me, to create a rulemaking standard as to when carriers could refuse to load those exports uh, and to monitor how many export container uh, containers each line handles. Um, and then allowing and empowering the FMC to kind of investigate those business practices. So it's a bit unclear how the industry itself will respond to these changes, uh, but given the increased oversight um, and the kind of more active role that the you know, government will play in terms of, okay, so 
providing oversight over shipping rates, um, it's highly likely that shippers will make some kind of adjustments in terms of uh, their pricing and routes. Again, it's really hard to predict how shippers will respond, uh, given the OSRA actually first, you know, passing uh, and then being signed into law and then implemented. Um, but something that certainly we're watching at EverStream and something that you know, we'll update our customers on uh, regularly. Okay, great. Next question. Uh, how do Canadian ports look in terms of being a good alternative? Right. So in the past, we've looked at Canadian ports as a potential, you know, quick buffer uh, in the short to medium term if things do get congested at uh, LA Long Beach. A port of Vancouver is still sitting at around two and a half days waits pretty consistently over the past couple of weeks. Uh, port of Prince Rupert, however, is at zero days waits, so that's a potential option. But one thing to note about West Coast Canada ports is that they rely on those very specific rail corridors that are vulnerable uh, to weather events. I mean, we saw this in the, in the end of 2021 when storms washed out those key trackways and cut off the facilities from effective ground transport. Uh, so I think that uh, in the short to medium term, Canadian ports provide a fairly uh, effective alternative if we see some surges on West Coast or some disruptions at Gulf or East Coast ports. But again, it's important to keep in mind those downstream disruptions that may occur and the vulnerability of those facilities uh, to you know, outside weather events in particular. Great, thank you. Uh, next question. Are disagreements over dock worker wages in other countries and labor strikes or actions any indication of how things may go in U.S. West Coast negotiations? Right. So right now we're seeing a dock worker strike in, in Germany, which is very different from what we see within the ILWU negotiations and potential strikes that may follow. I think that the ILWU situation is very unique. Uh, in the sense that it follows the historical dynamics of the previous uh, negotiations and the previous strikes, right? We have some precedent from, uh, you know, from 2000, from 2008, and from 2014 as to how these uh, kind of disruptions will uh, end up happening. Um, but I don't think that there's too much of a, of a connection necessarily internationally as a comparison, but I think that there's a very interesting connection with, uh, I think it was the ILWA, uh, the East Coast Port Association, um, that came out in solidarity with uh, the U.S. West Coast ports uh, for, you know, through these negotiations, but then also likely within the strikes themselves. Uh, so I would see that kind of a mirror, mirroring, um, you know, mirroring dynamic between West Coast and East Coast ports in terms of like their uh, main priorities uh, and potential support for labor actions. But I think that this situation is so unique in the terms of its cyclical kind of nature and the fact that um, the, there's so much precedent built up as to how this usually happens. The real unknown is how, you know, the government will respond, China surge. These kind of things are really the more, um, you know, unknown comparisons. Great. All right. We've got time for one more question. Uh, and of course, we will be continuing to monitor this situation. So do check uh, everstream.ai, our website frequently for regular updates. Uh, last question. Do we have any details for uh, or outlook on the timing of an import surge from China and what that might look like? Right. So I think the biggest wrench in the works in terms of a full resumption for uh, the import surge is the new set of lockdowns in Shanghai and the willingness of the government to continue its zero COVID policy. So if you asked me a week ago about when a potential surge may come, I likely say within three weeks to two months. But with the new lockdowns in Shanghai and business sentiment on reopening at new lows, um, that window has opened up really to one to three months, uh, pushing it further into back to school season. Again, the real unknown is the spread of COVID uh, within China, and the real known is China's strict adherence to the zero COVID policy and its corresponding political weight. So we've been really, really honing in on tracking those COVID outbreaks, uh, the government policy, and then actually what production is being resumed on the ground uh, in, in terms of like, okay, where are goods actually being produced and how has this impacted that time frame? So I'd say one to three, three and a half months or so. But again, this is a highly dynamic situation. And given more lockdowns, more strict COVID measures and increased cases, um, that number may change. 
Great. Well, thank you everybody for joining us today and we will be continuing to monitor this very dynamic situation. Uh, so do check back on our website. The Risk Center will keep you up to date. Thank you very much. Thanks, Tony. Thanks everyone.